Hello, so, I don't know what this video is. It's not your usual podcast episode. It's not a tutorial. You guys know I don't do tutorials because I don't have the skill, nor the patience, nor the setup and everything. Like things get out of focus in the brain when I'm looking at my knitting because I can't look through both at the time. It's just, it's a mess. This is kind of more supposed to be a, a walkthrough of a pattern that I am about to release or may have released at the time that I make this come out. Obviously it's not come out yet because it's not finished. Um, I'm at my mum's place for the holidays, so that is the level of professionalism we are dealing with today. Uh, you see we've got the Christmas decor still out, even though this is probably going to come out way later. So, I just happened to find a tripod here and I know that now is the best time I have to show you the process of uh, assembling this particular cardigan. Because I am making a full on Norwegian cardigan, a uh, Lusikofte, which I've designed and I'm probably going to name something clever. The working name is Kusikofte and yeah, it might involve a lot of steps that are new to a lot of you. It's very uh, a typical way of doing things in Norway, but also with a few additional steps that I prefer. So it might be something new and different to everyone. So I thought, this might be the kind of pattern where you read it and it's clear, but you go, yeah, but really though, is it? And I'm, I'm gonna just sit here and go, yeah, really. <laughs> so that's, that's the whole point of this video. It's not a tutorial, it's just me walking you through it and confirming your doubts or not confirming, this, this confirm. Anyway. <laughs> So, first of all, we have the yarn recommendations. I am using Sunnes Pergint. It is a lovely kofta yarn. It's a yarn that's been used throughout the years for kofta uh, cardigans um, in Norway. And I like it. It's nice. It's thick and heavy. It's kind of DK, but it feels a lot heavier, literally, on the, on the scale. And I think it's quite soft. I have also recommended other yarns, so that's Hillisborg Embla, Roma Tetro, Sticky Garn, Hold Super Soft if you hold it double, and other DK weight yarns. Now, you may find various places on the internet that these are categorized as maybe sport weight, maybe worsted. But the thing is, with these Norwegian yarns, we don't use these yarn weights, we don't talk about worsted or DK, we just kind of say oh, that's, that's kind of normal and that's kind of thinner and that's kind of thicker. <laughs> and these kind of all fall within the normal, I guess. And so I'm just going to recommend them across the board. Really, if you hold the strands next to one another, if you have all the yarns available, you'll see that they are quite similar. They will probably result in roughly the same texture. So I can only, of course, vouch for the yarn that I'm using, but my intuition says the other ones should work beautifully. And you should probably also be able to look at other DK weight yarns. And if you are working with non-superwash woolen spun sheep wool yarn of a, a sort of similar staple, a kind of Norwegian white sheep sort of yarn, wool, then you could probably also start looking into sport weights and worsted weights as well. So I say woolen spun. Woolen spun means that the yarn has been carded rather than combed. Co been combed, that's what we call the worsted spun, not to be confused with worsted weight. And I highly, highly, highly recommend using woolen spun because they just are more sticky and your cutting in the knitting without a sewing machine is going to be a lot less painful. You're not going to have an unraveling. The yarn's got a sort of velcro effect to it. That means that it doesn't want to unravel when you cut. I am going to try to cut on camera uh, what we call steaking, which has apparently become a verb now. <laughs> and it's not going to be a tutorial, but if you are looking for a tutorial, I highly recommend looking at the Very Pink Knit Steak tutorial. I'll try to remember to link it below, but I may forget, so bear with me there. But the yarn I recommend is essentially a tool for you to be able to cut in your knitting without any sewing. I would not use just this crochet stabilizer if you are using a superwash yarn, if you're using a packa, if you're using any sort of slick, smooth, long staple. I wouldn't even use it necessarily on merino, although obviously different merinos differ. The next thing you may notice in this pattern is that there is this big intimidating table called needles. And I'm recommending five needles. We have needle A, B, C, D and E. And I'm sure you're thinking, all my days, I am not making five swatches. I'm not making more than five swatches. No way, and you don't. 
So let me walk you through this. The one thing I want you to swatch for is needle B. Needle B is what I used for the stockinette. I consider the portion with the lice pattern, these dots here, to be stockinette. I don't get a different gauge just because I have a few rows in here with color work. The overall gives me 22 stitches to four inches or 10 centimeters. I'm gonna to refer to a stitch gauge. That is what I mean when I say the number of stitches to make 10 centimeters or four inches. So if you hear me say stitch gauge, that is what I mean. I don't get a different gauge just because there are a couple of rows in with some color work, but when I get into the big, big section here with color work, I personally need to go up in needle size and that is my needle C. So needle B gives me a 22 stitch gauge, but if I do color work, I get a 24 stitch gauge with needle B. So that is why I go up to needle C. Most people in my experience have to go up a needle size a little bit, just the next needle size up to get the same gauge. But there are people who do not need to change the needle size at all. So you can omit needle C altogether. And there are people who actually have to go down needle size because they do color work looser. So for you, needle C will actually be smaller than needle B. So that's why I want you to swatch for needle B and needle C to find out how to get gauge in stockinette and in stranded color work. You will also notice that the row gauges differ between these two. I would advise you not to worry so much about row gauge because I tend to write the length in patterns in inches and centimeters rather than rows. There are some exceptions here. Obviously when you get to the armhole, that will change because the armhole will start at a certain point. So if you find you get a very, very different row gauge to mine, then you may need to make some adjustments. But if not, if it's just off by a couple of rows, then don't fret about it. Again, same here. You just need to the amount of length that you need. Also, I would suggest measuring your row gauge and stitch gauge before and after blocking so that you know how your work in progress differs from how it will be after you have blocked it. And by blocking, don't do the big whole like pin and stretch thing. This is the cardigan, okay? So what you really need to do is just give it a soak and a dry. If you don't want to soak this entire thing, because honestly, this thing is still damp, it will take a while to dry. I recommend steaming it with an iron. That is usually what Norwegians do. I just didn't. So <laughs> that that's a big time saver and it will give you a pretty good result as well. And it can be good to know to what extent your stitch and roll gauge changes between before and after blocking, but not crucial. Just like a, a, a thing for those of us who are a bit nerdy about these things. So that was needle B and C, the ones I want you to swatch for. And once you have identified needle B and C, it's actually quite straightforward. I'm gonna read from the pattern here. Needle A needs to be a half a millimeter smaller than needle B. Because needle A is what you use hang on, for the inside of the folded hem, right? So you want that to be smaller so that when you fold it in, it's not going to flare, you know, you want it, it will need a basically smaller measurement to be at the inside of the work. I'm not going to get into the maths of that, but just trust me on that. You also want to use that for the cuff because the cuff actually uses a small needle size just to be a bit more snug around your hand or wrist. I will say the pattern is written for having particularly long sleeves, so it will also have to kind of go around your hand, but still needs to be quite snug. So yeah, just go down a needle size from your needle B when you do the folded hem and when you do the cuff. Pretty simple. And lastly, we have needle D. Needle D just needs to be half a millimeter smaller than A because A was for the cuff. And so we're again going down half a millimeter for the folded hem. Same as we did with the body, it's just a different needle size that we are comparing to. So C and E are really optional for those of you who get different gauge for stranded color work rather than stockinette. So really you just have B for the stockinette, um, the main body, and you have A for the cuff, and you go down half a needle size to do the hems. That is essentially it. So it looks big and intimidating, but you really only need to swatch for B to know the 22 stitch gauge of the main garment, and C to know if you need to change your needle size for the color work. And from there you can take shortcuts, and these are described in the patterns, I'm hoping, it sounds doable and yeah. 
Obviously, if you are super, super nerdy about these things, then by all means, make all the swatches you want. I'm not gonna stop you. I'm just saying there are ways to avoid these things because uh, who likes swatching anyway? <laughs> The next thing I have put in some simple color work guidelines. Um, basically, these things I just told you about trying to get the same gauge with stockinette and stranded knitting, and just not try to loosen up your tension. If you find that you have a different gauge for color work, just change the needle size. You do, however, want to make sure that your floats are the right length because if not, then you know the distance between two stitches here. Uh, will be too short and they will bunch together because the strand will be shorter than the portion of stocking net that you have uh, on the outside of that. So you want to make sure the float is long enough to span across the, the width of that portion of the fabric. You just do that by stretching out the stitches that you have on your right hand needle, so the stitches that you just knitted. Literally just take them, let's pretend I have a right hand needle here and I just go yeah, I guess stretch them out and if I can get them to span the same distance that I can if there were no floats there, if I was just doing stocking net, then I know the floats are the right length. If they can't do that, you need to take back and make sure your floats are long enough. I am not gonna get too much into issues about yarn dominance and things like that. I don't think it's the most interesting or first thing you need to know about color work, but as a general rule, no matter your knitting style, continental, throwing, picking, what have you, keep your contrast color to the left of your main color. So the contrast here being the light gray, the main color is the charcoal so just keep the, the contrast to the left you'll notice with the whole needle sizing system that i thought i was wrapping up i guess i haven't is that i call them needle a b c and d with c and e being sort of optional i am not going to refer to specific needle sizes in the actual pattern text because everyone it's at different tensions there is no right needle size for a particular yarn or a particular gauge you need to find your needle size by doing the swatch of C and, D and B. Uh, I have written some suggested sizes based on what I have found to be the average. I find that most Norwegian patterns that uses pegint and uses pegint at this particular gauge, they use a 3.5, so I have taken that as the, the average and made that the recommended needle, and all the other needles are based upon what B is. I personally used a four millimeter, so that's half needle size bigger than uh, what I actually recommend because I know I knit tighter than most people and I think if I put that in the pattern people would be very confused as to why their their attention is different than mine so really people do swatch but I have put in examples of what uh, a knitter like me would need so I used a 4mm for B that meant I had to go up to 4.5 for C I then went to a 3.5 for A 3 for D 375 for E. So that's a very broad range of needles. Um, there's no 2.5 here, which is what the pattern recommends because I have the rare skill of actually knitting even the thickest of yarns to very, very, very dense fabrics. So that's not something you needed to know. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> I'm not going to talk too much about the sizing in here. The main thing is the measurements I have written down at the time that I'm making this is for the garment measurements. So if your bust is say 100 centimeters around, don't choose that size, okay? This is a positive ease garment. I recommend going for something like 15 centimeters or six inches of positive ease. Unless of course you want a different ease than I recommend. But then do be aware that maybe other things will not add up in terms of length and stuff. But it's, it's up to you. I, this is not made to be a tailored garment. It's definitely a sort of snuggle up in cabin garment. So you're quite free there. I just thought I'd make that very clear. So I'm now going to actually talk you through the pattern. Finally, finally. I'm not going to give too much away, obviously. This is a paid for pattern. But I will tell you a couple of things. We're going to start at the bottom for a change. I always do my patterns. Uh, top down but in this case the lice pattern generally goes in this direction right so you've got the v's right the, this this is very clumsy okay let's use the scissor the v's go this way right for the lice pattern if you knit bottom up if i were to knit top down they will be pointing that way and it's a detail but it's a detail i care about so i i wanted them to point in the right direction and so the construction is quite traditional here so we're starting off with working stocking at it flat which is not my preferred way but there we are 
Um, so that's for the hem here. We are using we're using needle A for that. So things are being knit uh, rather tight for the the weight of yarn. But it does mean that the hem will hang quite heavily. It will not be too big to actually fold on the inside of your work. And yeah, as soon as you are working a, a pearl row here for the bottom, you then get to join in the round. And that is when I tell you to cast on, hang on, for the steek. The steek, so that is the portion between here. And I have now put in some crochet bands for that. I'm gonna try to come closer. Hello, so I'm on this side now. I have now put on crochet bands, so they look a bit different. But essentially, once you have done this pearl row, you come around here, you cast on your steak stitches, and now we are working in the round. And that you will do until you're done with this entire garment. And you will be asked to change to your needle C whenever necessary for the color work, if necessary for you. And there we are, you just keep knitting the steak. And as you will notice, now this is kind of hard to see now that I put in the crochet thingy things. More on that in the Very Pink Knits video I recommend. Um, I am not too fussy about how to work color work in the steak. I have included a chart in the pattern that has two rows that shows just alternating the color work. Um, it really, there is no right answer to how to knit the two strands in your steek. You just make sure it's every other stitch, every other color, basically. There's, it's not rocket science. It's not any sort of specific thing you have to do. Like here, I seem to have worked in one column of the, the contrast color here, because I had that yarn and I wanted to be catch, caught by the steek. And that is the main thing. It's not like anything in this line here is going to show in your final garment. So all of this, all the steek bits, everything from one pearl stitch to the other, it's not going to be visible, so don't worry too much about it. So now we are working all the way, all the way up, all the way. This is going to take you a whole summer if you're me. <laughs> and it was a heat wave, I am excused. It was really hot to work on this thing, but I did finish it now. And yes, so I just kept knitting. We're still working in the round. We still got the steak here. And we're starting different chart as you go along. You may change needle size, etc. And then I'm going to tell you to do something a bit weird. Because I'm not going to tell you to work flat when we get to the armhole. Oh no. I'm going to just tell you to, in the middle of your work, just cast on five stitches. Five stitches for, for the steak. You're not binding off anything. You're just literally in the middle of the row. Just cast on five. Again, it looks a bit funny now that I have put in the crochet stabilizer, but that's what people call crochet reinforcement. I just, I'm being very pedantic about it because I don't think it reinforces much, as much as it stabilizes. But anyway, so there will be a little hole here, like that. You can stick your finger through, you can do that on the other end as well. Yay! So that is, that is the steak actually for your armhole this entire length here and we're gonna cut through that I did also get you to do that on the other side because I don't know about you but I'm not gonna work this thing flat I just don't do color work flat and it's just not very pleasant and it can really mess up your tension because a lot of us do pearl differently than we do knits and perhaps even more so for color work and the stranding management can be difficult to maintain consistently on both sides so this just makes a more consistent look and now there is more weird things because what is this how are, how is anyone supposed to be wearing this the, uh, well there is another stick i got you to bind off the cardigan front stick here this is probably the kind of stick that you are most familiar with and you're binding it off already here and then we're casting it on again, which is a bit odd. This is actually the steak for the neckline. So this is your the shoulder up here, right? This is the weird box thing here. It's gonna be from shoulder to shoulder. And so this is your neck. And once we cut this open, it will just fall to either side of your neck. And we've gotta to try to wrap it up in the neckline that it's going to be folded. 
I did the same thing for the back as well. So later on at the very end of the pattern, I'm still not going to ask you to knit flat. I'm just going to ask you to bind off these stitches for the back of your neck and then cast on another stick, a little stick, a very tiny stick. It's not very long, but you still need to do the crochet reinforcement, which I've done, which is what all the strands are. And yeah, we're going to cut all these open and you're going to see how this weird, messy looking thing here is actually going to look like a cardigan in the end. Isn't that exciting? Again, I will tell you, this is not a tutorial. If you can't see things close up, that is because it's not a tutorial. Um, I just find them very difficult to make. Like things don't stay in frame or in focus when I do these things. So it's just to give you a general idea for whenever you are going through the pattern and you think that can't be right. And I'm like, yeah, but well, that's actually what you need to do. So I'm just gonna try to make sure I'm not cutting the wrong things. You don't wanna cut anything to do with the actual crochet chain here. Just make sure you're cutting the actual stick. Oh, it's always so scary. I never actually steak this yarn, so you know, this could go terribly wrong. But let's hope it doesn't. The neat thing about the crochet method, which is not something I will probably be able to show you, but I will try. Okay, you can see here. No, you can't. See, nothing's in focus. It's terrible. You can see here, maybe, that between these crochet bands, there are some bars sticking through. Again, this will be way more visible in the Very Pink Knit Steak tutorial that I love. You can see the bars will be revealed between the, the crochet bands, which is so helpful. So, I call them stabilizers because they can't reinforce yarns that doesn't want to be reinforced. They really only stabilize this, because if this is, these are your strands, right? These are your strands the way they are here. My fingers are the strands now. They're all connected. And then we cut through them. And when you normally do that, they go like this. They kind of fray. They don't unravel, they just kind of go, ah, I love the place. The crochet band just keeps them this way. And it also has the added feature of making them want to curl in. So that is quite neat too, just like an added bonus. So they will curl in on the inside of your work. But we're gonna wrap them up in some, some uh, button bands that are folded as well, just to match everything. So I've started the sticking. It seems to be going relatively well. I don't see anything unraveling. It's all good. Just, just keeping it. Just keep cutting. I think it's funny how steak has become a verb because I think it's just like an old word for what we call the actual stitches, the little bridge of stitches. Apparently that's what it means. And we sort of call it steaking now. I think it's like a thing that was revived by Alice Stormer is not something that's commonly used in the places where people actually do stick a lot. They just say it's cutting. They don't like necessarily have a specific word for it. I'm so glad I'm doing this in the spare few hours we have of daylight up here in Norway because, uh, well, you know, it's dark, it's dark yarn. So as you can see, what I'm constantly doing every time I've cut a few stitches is to just break apart the crochet chain just a bit more to give those bars, to make them more visible so I can see where I'm cutting. So I'm sure that I'm not cutting the actual crochet chain. All right, so I have cut apart the front of the cardigan, but as you will notice, it's still kind of stuck up here, right? There's something funny here. That is the neckline. So I'm gonna cut both the back neck and the front neck. 
The back neck steak is shorter because really I don't want it to dip too low in the back. This is just the bit, the length of the portion that I made it go lower, just so that it doesn't look too awkward when you um, cast on for the, the neck band. And there we have it. The neckline is now completely open. So I can actually lay it flat now, even though the armholes are not cut off. You can see now just how much more it looks like something you could actually wear. Right? This is really, really cool. This is not something most Norwegian patterns will actually tell you to do. They will have you work flat for this, this portion up here. And I just, I don't have time for that. So I've made you shape a crew neck along the steak, so there are decreases going on here. Again, don't want to give away too much of my pattern, but by steaking, you can work this in the round as well. And you have a nice, nice little crew neck going on here, as well as for the back neck. And yeah, we're gonna have to weave in these steak ends. You don't want to cut those off. And that's kind of the main thing I wanted to show you in this video. I'm gonna show you how to cut up the armholes as well. I'm gonna demonstrate conceptually how to place the sleeves in and how to sew them in. I have actually run out of yarn, so I can't actually do it, but I'm gonna show you theoretically. And yeah, let's get to the armholes. Ta-da! We have an armhole, and it's a big one because we are talking drop shoulders here. So that's one. We're gonna do the other one. Sometimes it can be quite tough to recognize where the steak begins because you have a, a cast on and a bind off, and you have the crochet chains, and it may all be and it may all be in the same color and so you're worried that you don't want to cut the wrong things and so for that purpose I tend to start in the middle sometimes and just work myself down in a surprising turn of events I actually have time and the opportunity to film me inserting the sleeves I don't have the time to actually insert them in front of you, but I have uh, basically a better example of how to do it. So, I'm gonna try to be in front of the camera somehow and show you kind of how to fit in the sleeves, let me. So this is what we got, this is the cardigan. I put on the button bands, neckline. It's pretty much done, everything is done, all the knitting is done, but it needs some sleeves, so First of all, we need to identify where the seam is. The seam goes along here, so you want that to be facing that way. So you want the seam under the arm. This is the kitchen table, it's not optimized. <laughs> uh, same thing here, seam's going, going under here, so the sleeve will come up here. Right, hopefully this makes sense. I should have cleared the table, I apologize. So what you want to do is turn this thing inside out. Check out those fancy pants floats. Anyway, I'm not here to boast about my floats. Let's just do it this way. All right. So that makes life a little bit easier. Let's just get this sleeve. And we want right side facing, again, the seam at the bottom of the sleeve going that way. And it, voila. We just put it through here, like so. So we've got, again, right sides facing. And the sleeve should be poking out here. And what you do, is sew it on so that anything from the steak, from the pearl stitch onwards, is invisible on the right side. And also the little pearl row round on your sleeve is also invisible. It can be visible, it's not the end of the world of it is, but that's kind of your, your border of what should be visible on the right side of your work. And once you have sewn on that, you then take this bit here and fold it over like so, and sew that over, over the entire kind of 
the where you've been seaming. So it will hide pretty much all the steak and everything and it will be invisible. And this will be a wormhole essentially. It will be covered by this sort of black line here. And so the result is that every steak possible is covered. It's all wrapped up into either the button bands or into the neckline. It's all very neatly tucked away so you don't have to worry about it. Whether you use the crochet method or whether you use your sewing machine, regardless, it will be invisible and hidden. Have fun making that cardigan. It's, it's quite a fun construction and it's nice that it's such a big drapey oversized thing. So if you are really worried about, you know, sewing together a piece that essentially has to fit really well, then this actually doesn't. It's a drop shoulder kind of boxy fit. It's kind of made so that you, you know, you could share it with the whole family and everyone can wear it when they're cold. So yeah, there's a lot of leeway here, which is quite nice. Um, I can't remember if I said this or if I cut it out because I did a lot of takes, but I did say in one of them that this is going to be quite a challenge for everyone, even the people who are used to the more Norwegian kind of construction method. Because, yes, the whole sticking up in the front is quite common, but usually they will ask you to knit flat from here up to here and also from the armhole. So actually this whole portion here is usually knit flat, which is annoying because that's usually where most of the colour work is. So I just try to make this kind of pattern the way I would normally do it, and that is to steek the whole thing, you know, just steek it all. So have fun with that. 